Good day everyone and welcome to our highlights from this week. This is our show where we discuss news that intrigued me this week. Uh, this week we're going to talk about uh, some interesting topics, uh, mainly about tech as opposed to tech and gaming, but uh, they're great topics nonetheless. So let's get started. So the first topic of today is by TechCrunch and it is about Amazon uh, planning on making their home uh, home audio device Alexa uh, with a seven inch speaker, sorry, se seven inch touchscreen uh, in 2017. This is kind of interesting because uh, for those of you who don't know what uh, Alexa is, it's a speaker. And the speaker is basically just a home household accessory uh, that you leave anywhere in your house in a room where uh, you want to communicate with uh, Alexa and have it help you. It's kind of like a Android or a Apple assistant where you communicate with it and you ask it to do things for you to make your life easier and make things hands free. So the interesting thing about this is that they're planning on making a speak, uh, making the speaker with a seven inch touchscreen. Um, there aren't any pictures of this yet, so I'm not really sure how they're going to implement it. But this is a picture, as you can see, of the speaker itself uh, as it is right now. So this is the 2016 model. So a touchscreen would probably go on top, I'm assuming. Uh, because they do still want to maintain the appearance of elegance uh, since it is going to be a household uh, furniture type device. Um, but the th main problem that we have with this is the fact that we don't know what they're going to use the touchscreen for. Uh, now it might help you uh, make some minute changes to things. It might make help you make uh, smaller decisions. But uh, some people have been critical about this because of the fact that adding a touchscreen kind of re reduces the fact that it's kind of wireless, right? The whole reason that you want to have the speaker is so you don't have your phone in your hand while you're at home and you can kind of get the weather or tell it to remember something just by speaking to it. Now, using a touchscreen kind of negates all that because now all of a sudden you have to go get up and go to wherever the speaker is located and uh, use it. Um, we're going to have to see exactly how they're going to deal with it. I at this point, I'm not sure what it would be used for. It might just be for uh, minor settings or maybe just uh, to make things a little bit more user friendly when, you know, voice just isn't enough. Uh, but hopefully Amazon will hope, uh, implement it in a way that it's not going to reduce the usefulness of the voice functionality, which is, has been really good so far. Uh, the next piece that we have uh, is by Nature World News, and this came out early in the week and it's about a large ice sheet being discovered on Mars. Uh, now for a while we've known that there was water on Mars, you know, there were you know reports of um, rivers and streams already on Mars and you know them being frozen and Mars having a history of having water. So the what's important about this is because we are planning to be a multi-planetary uh, society and we want to colonize Mars eventually, at least that's what you know, Elon Musk and those space frontiers are planning on doing. Uh, we're going to need some sort of source of water and this, these ice sheets may be that solution. Uh, they say that these ice sheets are actually bigger than some of the lakes, uh, like some of the great lakes on earth, which are pretty massive in size so if if this is set if this is supposed to be uh true and we can make use of this water it's actually going to be really really uh useful for humanity as we move forward and become a multi-planetary species uh the biggest thing that we need to be concerned about right now is why it's ice uh the main reason the, re the main reason that water on mars is currently ice is because there's such a little amount of atmospheric pressure on Mars. Uh, you know, the atmosphere that we have on Earth is what keeps everything that uh, that's going on Earth alive, keeping Earth, Earth, uh, as we know it. Uh, Mars has been said to have atmosphere in the past, but it has slowly been eroded away by uh, solar flares. Uh, 
uh, once Mars's co uh, core became uh, solidified and the magnetic field died down. So in the same sense that our magnetic field on Earth is what's protecting us from the solar rays and radiation uh, and keeping our atmosphere stable, uh, it's the same thing that was supposed to have existed on Mars and uh, have ever since uh, being removed has caused the atmosphere to go away. And without at the atmosphere, the water itself has solidified, it has frozen, uh, because you do need the atmospheric pressure to keep the water in liquid form. So if we are to colonize Mars, these are the hurdles that we will have to face because we will need to create some sort of atmosphere if we're going to be living in the open. Uh, otherwise, we will, have be, uh, we will have to be living in bubbles as uh, we've been doing for... Well, we've been doing so in TV shows and so on. Um, next, it's uh, by the International Business Times. And this is kind of a piece on uh, something that came up as uh, because of what happened with the election. As you know, uh, Donald Trump is supposed to be the next president of the United States. Um, by the way, there's going to be a ton of Donald Trump related tech posts in t weeks to come because I don't see this being the only thing that's going to be the major thing. Uh, although we've been, I think even last week we talked about net neutrality. But anyway, this one is kind of not really what people are fearing. I mean, uh, the Internet Archive uh, is a website that uh, it's a not for profit website that basically keeps track of all the websites that have existed or not not all of them but as much as they can find uh, and in 2014 they have been said to have up to 15 petabytes of data stored on their servers in the United States that's about 15,000 terabytes of uh, websites and website history uh, it's a really cool site and you should definitely check it out it's called the Internet Archive and essentially it has what the website looks like right now and how it looked in the past so it's kind of like a massive library um, of how websites are what exact websites exist and what haven't existed so um the issue that they're facing is they're saying that because trump's administration will uh focus on a little bit more of web uh censorship we don't know if that's going to be true obviously but what they're claiming is that Trump's administration will probably reduce the net neutrality of the web. And uh, they're worried that the government will censor websites in the future. So what they're planning on doing is they want to move their servers to Canada, um, which seems unlikely. I, I mean, as somebody who lives in Canada, I don't see that happening. Canada itself has some laws that are not the best for neutrality. But... Um, there, if there is any substance to this, they're saying it's going to cost a lot of money and they're asking for donations to make this happen. Uh, this may just be, you know, them riding the cocktails of Trump's win and, you know, kind of using the fear that public has right now to gain some uh, donations. Uh, but again, the threat right now, we can't tell as it is until Trump actually becomes the president and until we see what he does with the Internet. Um but if these threats are true, then uh, I don't know if Canada is the choice that they want to pick. They might want to pick something even more neutral, um, some maybe sometime, somewhere in Europe or anywhere else, really. Um, but that, that's the thing it is. And moving 15 petabytes of data is not going to be a simple task. So uh, I wish them the best of luck if they're actually going to have to do that. But um, I, at this point, I don't think that's going to be a case. Um, next, uh, we're going to talk about this piece on Medium, uh, where they're talking about the new MacBook Pro. So this is the, the one that Apple most recently released. Uh, it's the MacBook Pro with that touch bar on the front that replaces the function keys. Um, now, me personally, I'm not the biggest fan of this device, but this is talking about the benefits of it. So we will definitely take a look at what the benefits are. And this article itself focuses mainly on the changes that they've made to the previous models. The main change being the USB-C port. 
Uh, now, I've been a big advocate of USB and USB-C for that matter, uh, just because it's universal, right? That's what the U stands for. The universal factor is really important. And I think Mac users will definitely benefit from that because having that USB-C port means that now this MacBook will become just like any other uh, portable device. And they don't have to worry about looking for a specific charger cable or anything like that because now they can just use any other mobile charger, uh, any other uh, car charger, anything like that. So what they were talking about is how their current adapter is just a USB adapter. So even though it has the same appearance as the old MacBook charging adapter, it's just a USB-C charger. So you could actually use even a charger from a phone like the Nexus uh 6p or even the new google pixel any charger for those devices will work on the new macbook because of the fact that it's a universal standard um and this benefit again will mean that you could use car chargers or any other even battery banks to charge your macbook which is pretty awesome uh now some criticism that i personally have about it is again the fact that it only has a limited number of usb c ports i believe it's two uh which is nowhere near as much as they need if you're use if you have the macbook plugged in you're already using up one port which leaves you only one additional port to plug in any type of accessory and this being a professional device that just isn't enough and the fact that you need an adapter for pretty much anything else including uh, sd cards will make it much much harder for any type of professional who uses this device on the go especially professional uh, videographers photographers pretty much anybody in the media business who are currently using the MacBook, I think that's one of the biggest demographics, they're going to have a massive problem with this. I think the only person that will actually benefit from the less ports is going to be like a businessman who would only maybe have to use this for, to make a presentation once in a while. But again, the USB-C itself is going to be a plus. And the cool thing about these dongles that Apple release, as you can see, you could actually use these dongles or other USB-C devices. So that is actually a win for USB-C. Since Apple is finally accepting USB into their family, uh, the other, everybody who currently uses USB -C, uh, now finally has the benefit of all these uh, adapters that people, including Apple and even third parties make, and we can finally use them. So as you can see in this picture, this is a Nexus uh, 6P mobile phone using uh, Apple's Ethernet dongle and as you can see it's plugged straight into the USB-C port and the Ethernet cable is plugged into the dongle and that allows your phone to get insanely fast speeds uh, speeds that you would probably not be able to get through Wi-Fi uh, on a mobile device so it's really cool it's really great to see that uh, finally since Apple's playing kind of uh, fair that uh, the benefits will actually trickle down to even third parties uh but again it's going to depend on how they're planning to use this uh, again this is, there's another example right here of um uh, apple's uh sd card dongle uh, this might not actually be apple's but a third party one but as you can see the benefit is because of these adapters we can now use uh what th those adapters are used for on other devices as well uh which is great uh from this article like they're talking about the benefits of this to macbooks itself uh for me i see this as the benefits of this to the usb and the universal industry itself because i think apple users are kind of losing out a bit because of the fact that you know they they are so limited by the hardware uh but because ad apple's adopting this and i'm pretty sure in the future version they're going to have multiple ports at least four in my opinion uh i mean they would actually have to be pretty stupid if they don't plan on uh doing that uh which apple is not i think they just want to use this as the highlight and then later on in future versions they're going to actually implement it in a better way um but uh like i said the, right now it's a great win for people in general and i think uh apple by doing this they've actually shown some growth and hopefully they'll continue to in this path and slowly reduce the amount of proprietary hardware that they have and uh just a quick note on the magsafe uh, people have been complaining about the fact that the new usb-c charging cable means that they no longer have the cool little 
MagSafe feature that um, Apple devices used to have, which honestly was really cool because, you know, tripping over wires is something that happens on a, in a public area, especially at schools, universities, uh, anywhere you take a mobile device like a laptop, it's potential to uh, happen. So um, the only thing I can see right now, the best way they can uh, kind of avoid that is to get a third party device like this. Uh, this device is by Griffin and it's basically the USB-C cable, but with the MagSafe connector so that you could plug the MagSafe end into your laptop and you leave it plugged in. I'm not really sure it's going to be the best looking thing, but it's going to work. And you could just quickly connect the cable using the magnet. And if it is tripped off, then it'll just come right off and you don't have to worry about your laptop uh, falling onto the ground. Uh, and hopefully because again, this is third party uh, enabling because of the USB standard, these uh, cool little uh, add-ons are actually gonna come to the other markets as well. So, you know, I can buy one for my mobile phone because it's gonna be the same standard. Uh, which is really cool um, and of course these uh, adapters from USB uh, 2.0 which is the micro USB in this case uh, again same thing it's just really great that Apple finally started using universal standard instead of their proprietary ones so next uh, let's talk about a little bit more serious note um, this is an article about AT&T, uh, about what they've recently done by kind of, you know, this, the article by the word is kind of, you know, the title is kind of over-exaggerating a bit, but they are threatening net neutrality. Um, the reason for this is that AT&T uh, is going to be offering its customers uh, unlimited usage uh, of media that's uh, being sent from direct TV. So uh, for those of you who don't know, direct TV is a television company that's owned by AT&T. So by net, new, uh, by net net neutrality rules, all internet traffic is equal. But what AT&T is trying to do is basically they have the uh, bandwidth caps for all internet except for direct TV. If you're watching direct TV content, you're gonna get to uh, watch that content without any limits. So that won't affect your monthly bandwidth cap. Now this is gonna be, it's gonna be good for customers in the short term because again, you're not paying for that bandwidth and you get to enjoy that content. But in the long run, it's not gonna be good because by doing this, it's gonna be inhibiting uh, competition. Even companies like Netflix, uh, you know, that these companies uh, slowly grew up because of the way that people use them. Now, if AT&T is giving, getting an unfair advantage because their DirecTV uh, is easier to access compared to Netflix, people may go on to DirecTV just because of that ease, ease of access, making it harder for Netflix to make a profit. Now, in this example, I've been using Netflix because uh, it's, a, it's a very common site. But think of this in a way that, um, you know, Let's say I started a streaming company or even a website for that matter, and I want to get my content out to uh, my user base. Now, whenever my content is streamed out to you guys, AT&T says, you know, you're going to be, uh, your users are going to be charged this much per month for their bandwidth. But AT&T's uh, suppliers, or even let's say my, my competitor, uh, pays AT&T to get access to their uh, uh, partnerships and the partners don't have to pay either so basically my competitor by paying AT&T now has the benefit that a benefit that I don't have and this really really impedes uh, the whole point of uh, net neutrality this impedes growth and this impedes uh, competition because not everybody on the internet is no longer at that same level and this comes to us uh, after some issues that we've seen with the FCC, uh, you may remember last week we talked about how uh, the FCC was kind of laying off some of the harder uh, topics 
uh, and, and leaving them for the new uh, presidency. Uh, now, this is going to be a big issue because since they don't have ha those things hammered down, the new presidency can set up new rules that will make it so that one company can do this. A company like AT&T can lobby and gain access to doing this and essentially destroy net neutrality. Uh, I really hope this is going to be turned down like anything else. But the bigger concern to me right now is the fact that it's been popping up so commonly. Uh, you may remember uh, uh, that like this, this has happened last year and the year before and so on. So this is not something new. And you could see how much money is in play just by how often this keeps popping up. Almost on a yearly basis, we see a new big threat to neutrality. Uh, so my bigger fear isn't this in particular, but the fact that just so many companies are still out for net neutrality and they're, you know, they have an out for it. So that's the biggest problem. Uh, as you can see uh, in this article, they explain how uh, uh, the FCC did write a letter back saying that they discourage what at and is doing because of the fact that there is a benefit that at and is making uh, because the re zero rated service is going to be about $16 a month for their uh, their service providers that they've authorized. But every time they ha have more customers and a greater amount of content, this price goes insanely high. And eventually it's going to be, it's not going to be worth it for companies to pay that rate and do it. So uh, they've done a great job of, uh, kind of firing back at at and but again like i said with changing tides there's going to be a threat of this happening in the new administration so in that sense yeah i'm more afraid in the topic that we talked about earlier with uh, the internet archive not so much uh next article we have is by fortune uh and it's about sales of google's new phone uh, the pixel so uh, the Pixel is Google's new phone that replaces the Nexus device. And it's definitely been kind of a weird device, in my opinion, especially. I've, I, I'm actually a user of the Nexus 6P. And for me, the device appearance is nothing fantastic. And I think that's been said a lot. It's not something that looks, you know, fantastic. And it's actually kind of looks a little bit like iOS devices and I guess for me that may be a turn off but I guess that may be a success story in terms of uh, what Google did because I think that's actually helping with some of the sales maybe uh, but in terms of the software and the way that the hardware is actually built on the inside it's actually an amazing device and uh, I think the public is actually understanding that because in the last long weekend the black friday and cyber monday uh long weekend that we just passed uh google pixel device activations were up 112 percent uh, which is a massive amount compared to the previous activations of the previous four weeks so the previous month they were much lower and it went up 112 percent now if you compare that to their uh rival Apple and Apple's iPhone 7 in that week, same weekend, theirs only went up 13%. And if you compare that to Samsung, which is the Android's current highest uh, level uh, device maker, uh, Samsung's Galaxy S7 uh, grew by 36%. So even with that higher 36%, this 112% is a massive jump up. So the pixels are doing something right. And I think we can thank Google for that because Google's been really stepping up their game in terms of marketing and getting the devices out there in people's hands so that they could try it out and see for themselves why this device is so much better than other devices. Uh, now these statistics can be affected because of the fact that the iPhone 7 and the Galaxy S7 both came out a bit earlier than the pixel. So the pixel is the most recent phone to come out. So they they do have that benefit but even then if you compare um iphone 6s and 6x plus sales uh respectively they went up 36 percent and 29 percent 
uh, in the same weekends last year. So when you look at it in that way, iPhone 7's growth is actually low. Uh, it's on the low side because their own previous model did much better in that previous year than their new model did. And I think a portion of that must have gone to Google itself, uh, with Google Pixel, because I'm pretty sure some Apple uh, customers may have been convinced by Pixel and what it offers. So um, it's Google's going to make a ton of money, and they're estimating uh, millions of units to be sold. Uh, I believe their numbers were in the range of... Uh, lost track of where the numbers are. Okay, yeah. So they're predicting they would sell around uh, 3 million Pixel devices in this fourth quarter, so the last three months of this year, and then another 5 million to 6 million next year, uh, which is a significant amount, and I'm pretty sure it's much more than Google anticipated they would sell, and uh, it's doing a significant dent into Apple sales, although Apple is still going to be making much, much more money than Google on this phone alone because of their other devices out there and their overall profits. Uh, but this probably did a significant dent into their uh, bottom line, uh, at least I believe so. Next, let's take a look at an article about Tesla. Um, this is about Tesla winning a kind of a fight against the dealerships in Virginia. Uh, now, Virginia is a state where uh, companies are allowed to have their own uh, sales, sales uh, dealerships, but they have to show that other companies like third-party dealerships will not be able to sell their product or are not willing to sell their product. And Apple had to prove to the DMV in Virginia that that was the case. And uh, eventually they did win. And basically they were able to overturn a previous decision that the DMV made and are able to get their dealership license in Virginia. Uh, this is big because... Um, Tesla's been kind of changing the way the markets have been. They've been making their own devices and selling their own devices, their own cars, uh, in their own dealerships. And this is different from the normal uh, automotive model where a company makes these cars and then sells them to third-party dealerships for a wholesale price, and they sell it. But Apple, sorry, Tesla, uh, were able to convince the DME that these third-party models are not going to work with their cars because these third-party companies are making their money through services like oil changes, tire rotations, what have you. Uh, and these services are not stuff that will need to be done to the Tesla because it's an electric car. So an electric car does not need oil changes or uh, a lot of the common maintenance stuff that gasoline cars do. The only things that really wear out are the tires and the brakes. Um, so in terms of that, I think, um, Tesla has a pretty big point and that dealerships will not be able to make a profit in the same sense. And that along with the fact that Tesla is not willing to provide, uh, their cars for any, uh, sale price or wholesale price. Uh, and because they're not getting any discounts, third party, uh, dealerships will not be able to make much money off of selling model S's or any other Tesla car. And for that reason, um, Tesla was able to prove that this wasn't gonna work. And with the support of other Tesla owners and enthusiasts that showed up at the hearing, uh, they ruled in their favor and they were able to get their uh, dealership license. So it's pretty interesting to see that. And I, I really like hearing good news in that fact because I, I like to see progress in the way we do things. I don't like it when companies try to keep uh, things the way they are and fighting change because change is going to happen and the only way that uh, you're going to succeed is if you accept that change and adapt with it if you're going to fight change it's just going to run you over so um we have another small uh, electric vehicle article next it's also by electric and this article is about audi's first all-electric vehicle uh, and technically, this is not 
a car that will be sold to consumers because Audi's first full electric vehicle will be available to consumers in 2018. Uh, but this is an electric vehicle that they're designing uh, using their EV technology, Audi e-tron. Uh, and this electric vehicle is being designed to run on the moon. Now, this is a part of a competition that Google had for their Google's Lunar X Prize competition. And uh, they, what they wanted people to do was to create a rover that can uh, m um, move around using electric technology without anything else in them and take pictures of the lunar surface. And then this is what they're hoping for. So they will be sending this out into uh, into the moon on a Tesla, uh, sorry, SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, and uh, they'll be sending two of these up, actually, not one, because they want to make sure not there's no failures. So they'll be sending two of these up in a lunar lander they call Alina. And these two will go up in a Falcon 9 rocket in 2017 so this will be technically um audi's first electric vehicle uh, since other vehicles sold to consumers uh, consumers will not be available until 2018 so uh they're planning to win the uh, google's uh, lunar prize and that prize will be 30 million uh, us dollars so uh, if they succeed they do uh they will win a lot of money uh, and more than that, I think they're doing it for the press because definitely sending that out and getting those pictures on the moon. And uh, since they're sending two devices, I think they're planning on actually taking a picture of one device with the other device and having that Audi logo on the moon, I think will be amazing advertising. So uh, definitely uh, going to be something that is worth all the effort that they're putting into it and it will be having the same it will be using the same technology that the, they plan to use in their car so that's pretty cool uh, you if you do buy an audi electric vehicle in 2018 you'll be using a car that has a uh, technology that was also used on a rover in the moon so that's pretty cool and our final article for today or for this week is by npr now, uh, this article is about um, Uber and how they're tracking their passengers' locations. And starting soon with this new update, they'll be tracking it all the time. Uh, now, this comes as a concern to uh, some people because of privacy, mainly. Uh, people don't really want to be tracked unless they they give consent. And the way that they are doing this is with a new update. Uh, users will have to consent whether or not they want to be tracked either never or always. So there's no middle option where you can only be tracked while you're on a ride. Uh, now, Uber offers some benefits for being tracked. For example, you get to uh, see exactly what path you were taken in and uh, dispute any, uh, you know, any funny business that the driver did um but the thing is uh, uber is planning on tracking you beyond your ride so after you get off and you're walking away from your ride you're still being tracked by uber and the app can be tr uh, tracking you even when it's not open which was the case uh which wasn't the case before because before if the app had to be open on the screen in order for you to be tracked now if it's even in the background you can it can track you uh, I'm pretty sure Uber is going to get into some trouble with this and they will eventually refine their um, policy so that they can uh, they will only track after. Uh, Uber does say that they only track for five minutes after the trip in their statements. However, they've been caught before and they've even paid fine to the uh, fines to the New York City. Uh, I think around twenty thousand dollars for a God view tool that they had before where their employees were actually using this tool to track users without even them knowing. So they have had some issues with privacy in the past and uh, this will definitely cause way more issues for them than I think they're going to be willing to deal with. So I'm assuming that they will probably do the right thing and push out an update that will allow you to refine that, those settings. That way you're only tracked while you're on your ride and not before or after. Um, but that's about it, I think, uh, for this week. Those were the topics that really interested me this week. So, um, 
yeah, that concludes our topics for this week's show. Uh, we would love to hear your opinions on any of today's topics. So uh, please leave a, uh, remember to leave a comment or uh, contact, contact us through our social network accounts uh, because we'd definitely like to hear your, opin your opinion on any of these topics we discussed today. Also, uh, you can use these platforms to suggest topics on future shows. So if there's anything else in the next weeks that uh, interests you in terms of tech or gaming, let us know and uh, we may even feature your shows. Um, so as always, uh, please remember to like this video, subscribe to our channel and check out our other videos. And yeah, please share this uh, with your friends so we can talk even more. Uh, until next time, guys. Peace.